The story of my life remains written on these pages. But my fate has always been my own. Every deed, every choice, every person I met made me what I am. Could I have taken a different path? Could I have found a different calling? Altered the very course of history? And what price would I have to pay? Greetings fellow YouTubers and welcome back to The Life and Suffering of Sir Brante. As we are continuing the life path of Bran Brante, uh, we are now approaching the uh, midpoint, uh, the middle point of uh, the peacetime chapter. So previously on Sir Brante. Uh, in the previous session, in the previous episode, we uh, have started an affair with Octavia Milanidas, and we have grown uh, quite close with her. We uh, insisted that uh, she must treat us uh, like an equal. Uh, we started an equal romance with her. Uh, we have also uh, uh, been as entrusted with a case against uh, Dorius Otton, uh, the noble Arknian, the high commander of the province, uh, who was accused of violence against his own legionnaires. Uh, most importantly, we uh, have entered a very villainous deal with Remy Elverman, the magistrate of Anizot, and uh, gained his uh, patronage. Uh, in doing so, we uh, betrayed our immediate superior, Augustine Elborn, uh, because uh, there was a strife among us and um, there was a strife between us, and uh, we decided that. Brand decided that it would be better if. Uh, he sided uh, with some other parties. Uh, however, we still have um, some degree of sympathy toward Elborn, uh, and uh, he uh, feels the same for us, I guess. But our prime ally is this huge supporter of old traditions and uh, uh, all around uh, reactionary, Remy Elverman. Uh, who opposes any and all change in the Empire. Uh, Bran doesn't care much for his uh, traditionalist views. What he does care about is that Remy has the power and connections to uh, make uh, Bran's job that much easier, to help him uh, replace Elborn as, uh, as Prefect of Magra, and to bring uh, villainous Dorius Otton before the Noble Court of Honor. Right now we actually have everything we need to uh, make Otton face the Court of Honor. Moving on. The Festival of the Silver Tree. Today is an important holiday. The entire Empire is celebrating the Festival of the Silver Tree, which commemorates the parting gift of the Twin Gods, the divine tree they planted in our mortal world in the middle of Anizot. The families of the city spend the day in peace and quiet, contemplating the divine roots that join together all people, their bloodlines and the entire Empire. Ooh, what a nice holiday! Mother always oversees this holiday. The day before the festival she seemed to have shaken off her usual apathy and engaged in the preparations with excitement. It was as though her illness has loosened its grip. Okay, uh, the entire family gathers for the holiday meal. Uh, father is in high spirits today, sharing jokes with me and Nathan. Uh, Stefan is uh, trying to suppress an atypical agitation. Gloria is the last to join us at the table. She is wearing new breeches with high stockings and a yellow vest. Gloria, you are wearing men clothes again. No, mother. I am wearing clothes w women are forbidden to wear. <sighs> Gloria, petulant as ever. Okay, uh, suddenly Nathan speaks up. A few days ago in the market I saw a grocer dressed as overseer Gaius Tempest. He had a huge carrot for a scepter. He got a sound rubbing, of course, but until then it was quite a hood. Oh, Nathan, thank you, thank you. You're always there to ease the tension. Okay, everybody laughs at the ridiculous story, relieved. Even Gloria has a smile on her face when she sits down. The feast commences. Our home finally feels warm for a moment. It wasn't so long ago the four of you couldn't even reach up to this table. The first word you said, Gloria, was gimme. Nathan used to cling to my skirt all the time, almost tearing it. And you, Bran, you couldn't talk at all yet, but your piercing stare was so expressive it felt as if you were talking to me. 
Mava looks at Stefan and suddenly grows quiet. When I met Stefan, he was already three years old. He was so serious and a smooth talker to boot. I remember that he had a music teacher, but he was too shy to play in front of me. So I used to listen from the next room. Stefan's face twitches. He rises and moves to the old uh, har harpsichord. harpsichord. Uh, okay. His fingers fly gracefully over the keys. A melody fills the house, melancholy and sweet. The last note lingers in the air. The family is awestruck. Words fail you all. Who wrote that? A nobleman from the capital between drinking a glass of wine and beating a servant? Mm. Stefan calmly turns to face her. No, it was I who composed this piece of music. It is called Mother. Mother rises to her feet and Stefan put his, uh, puts his arms around his stepmother's waist, then detaches himself awkwardly. May the twin gods bless you, Lydia. Oh. Stefan cares about Lydia in his own way. I think he cares even about Gloria in his own way. He is a flawed uh, person, but still a good person at heart, I think. Gloria considers this scene with, with thinly veiled fury in her eyes. Of course, highborn nobles like Stefan are made for the arts. They are the only ones lucky enough to have a soul and experience inspiration. Unlike us, the lowborn, we aren't supposed to feel anything but suffering, let alone expressed in poetry. Everyone notices that Gloria is clutching pages filled with writing, her poems. My sister casts a mournful gl glaze at the family and her eyes rest on me. <coughs> okay, we only have two options here. We can let Gloria read her rhymes or interrupt Gloria. Both uh, options damage our unity uh, because one of them uh, pisses Stefan off and uh, the other one pisses Gloria off. We can't appeal to Mother because our relations with Mother are quite cold. But I wouldn't have done it anyway, because who needs... Uh, it, it, it would still piss Gloria off, like, who who needs mother and her religious yammering? Uh, mm. Well, my choice is obvious here. I rise from my seat and speak. Uh, hey, hey, guys, folks. Um, this is a family gathering. Uh... Let's not concern ourselves with uh, lots and uh, all this stuff, uh, all this spiritual stuff. You know, uh, Gloria uh, can express her feeling too, I think. Uh, Stefan's music is beautiful, but why is he the only one who has the right to delight Mother with his creations? Uh, we are family. There shouldn't be lots among us. Like, uh, we're, we should be equal in our own home. We should treat each other with decency. Come on. Let Gloria read her poems. But what about her lot, son? Gloria is permitting herself to practice a noble activity, thus breaching the divine order. I want to say shut up, mom. But what I say out loud is uh, that, uh, mother, times have changed. Art uh, isn't just a pleasure for the nobles anymore. It's also a trait uh, applied by many commoners. Many lowborn uh, tradespeople are taking up the pen and ink rather than the hammer. Uh, this is their labor and their suffering now. Pursuing arts can be hard, can be hard work, hard labor. What's so wrong with it? Gloria, please. Emboldened by my support, Gloria steps into the center of the room. Her eyes are fixed on father. A stranger and a bastard, I am called. I am, but still I long for you to say that I am yours, and melt the icy cold that burns within my heart both night and day. My mother and my brothers all are near, but I feel cold, as though we were apart, ashamed, yet still compelled to make you hear. I long to hold you closely to my heart. I am a stranger, tis my only crime. Forgive me, oh, but mercy is forbidden. I hope you'll see, if not forgive, in time. My bitter laugh, both joyous and well hidden. Oh, Gloria longs so much for a place to belong. Like, 
She wants to be a part of something, a part of family, I, I understand that. She has no place in the world, that's what eating her up inside, that's why she's so petulant and uh, confrontational and uh, so rebellious. She, she, she wants somewhere to belong, she wants a place, a, a, a name and a home. I understand. Flower stares at her in bewilderment. Gloria, I... Stefan springs to his feet and leaves for his chamber, slamming the door behind him. Well, that was uh, an immature thing for you to do, Stefan. What's so wrong? Why can't Gloria express her love for our father? I don't feel so well. Nathan, son, please help me to my room. Mother leaves the room, leaning on Nathan's arm. The celebration is cut short. <sighs> Oh, Stefan and my mother are something. The bright side is uh, we supported Gloria. Uh, we did not uh, shut her down. Stefan is um, disappointed in us. Our unity is damaged. Great. Great. But I do not regret my choice. Oh, a rendezvous with Octavia. Oh, finally something pleasant. Octavia and I do not see each other very often. Sometimes, as the days wear on, I forget about our unusual uh, affair. But then she bursts into my life and I abandon uh, myself to passion, until she disappears again. Today Octavia is waiting for me at her summer home in the city. It is a cozy little villa well concealed from prying eyes by high fence. Beyond the fence is a glorious garden. I have never seen one so beautiful in Magra. She meets me on the veranda, she is wearing a light white frock that leaves her shoulders exposed. Her black hair cascades down her back. My lady. She grins and draws uh, me toward her so that I sit down by her side. The sun is melting beyond the horizon. Octavia commands her servants to leave us alone. Tonight she is strangely pensive, barely touching her food and drink. Uh, my lady, uh, Octavia, is everything all right? You seem uh, preoccupied today. If anything is amiss, listen to me, Bran. I am at a crossroads. My father, the Archduke, is planning to send me out of Magra for a while. Apparently, in his opinion, my escapades are bound to cause trouble for our family. Oh, I, I know this uh, feeling, I know this problem, we have it in my family too. Mm. Octavia stands up, her eyes burn with a menacing flame. I am a daughter of the great family of Milandas, an Archean born at the peak of the world. All shall tremble before me. Isn't that so, Bran Branta? Well, uh... If uh, it pleases you, I am certainly trembling before you right now, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, okay, what is on your mind? What's the problem? Before I can reply uh, any further, Octavia abruptly lowers her head. I'm not free. Just like you, my dear human Branta. I have a duty to my family, to my blood tide, to the Empire. My whole life, all I've ever done is fulfill obligations created by others. I have no aspirations. Everything is preordained. What the world is like, how I ought to live. What my father doesn't decide for me those two up on the peak of a shining pillar or a lady have. I am looking for a way out of this cage. It must exist. I study history, but all I find are tidbits of lost knowledge. But I believe that I am not the first to try to escape the chains of this world. What am I to do, Bran? You yearn to break free of the fetters of fate just as I do. You have escaped the commoner's lot and joined the higher estate. Indeed I have, and indeed I yearned to break free. But your new lot is just as much of a prison, isn't it? Could it really be that none of us will ever be free? Octavia looks into my eyes dolefully. I have never seen her soul helpless before. So, one option is close to us, uh, Octavia has to be our patron uh, for, to ask for her assistance. Well, because it's a very um, callous uh, option uh, to choose, basically it's like, oh, 
Brant, please listen to me. I am in existential turmoil at the brink of uh, existential depression. Yeah, yeah, my dear, that's all very nice and sad, but let's speak about my job. <laughs> yeah, uh, can't do that. We are too close with Octavia, we take her problems to heart. Okay, we, sh we can share our revelation. We can relate to Octavia the grandeur of a twin god's design. Mm, not uh, Brant's puff, he does not respect the twins uh, that fervently to preach to Octavia. Inquire about this arcane knowledge. Uh, we ask Octavia about the lost knowledge she has been seeking. Mm, once again, a unique option because we have grown close, but once again, uh, Bran uh, does not uh, take that mu uh, much interest in arcane mysteries of the world. Lose ourselves in pleasure. We encourage Octavia to remember the joys of this earthly life. So... Octavia needs my advice, my honest opinion about uh, whether we can ever be free. And I think Bran Branta has an answer for her. Look, I pull Octavia close and embrace her. The Arknian lays her head on my chest. Quietly we watch the shining pillar blaze in the rays of the setting sun. I delicately touch my beloved. Her neck, her shoulders, her fingers. And I'll try to calm Octavia down. I do my best. Look, my dear. It's not that um, we are not free. I think actually we are free because uh, the twin gods take no interest in our earthly affairs. However, I think... Each of us uh, has, some might call them barriers, but I think uh, a better word is responsibilities. Each of us has certain responsibilities. A simple judge has his responsibilities, and a lady of a Milanides family has ours. However, if we forsake our responsibilities, if we forsake our duties, only re reprisal and ruin await us, because uh, if we forsake our responsibilities, we forsake ourselves, our very nature. And uh, isn't it uh, dishonorable to oneself to betray your very nature, who you are, and uh, who you are in this world? However. In their wisdom, the twin gods uh, left something to us to ease the burden of our responsibilities. The earthly pleasures. Look at this world, my dear Octavia. Many pleasures await us here. A familial love, bonds of friendship, fine food and drinks. I look her intently in the eye. Uh, the pleasures of uh, love, spiritual and uh, physical. We may, we may not have much time together on this earth, but while we are still here, while we are still together, we must savor every minute of it. That's my answer, Octavia. That's the best freedom I uh, can uh, describe to you. The freedom to embrace the woman you love. The freedom to kiss her and caress her and look at her with love in my eyes. To savor these earthly pleasures provided to us by the twins. Isn't that enough? I love whoever I want, I do what I deem necessary to do and I am content. In my honest opinion, that's how life should be lived. Octavia detaches herself from me and smiles playfully. I think you are not as simple as you wish to appear, Bran. I will wager you are seeking far more than the pleasures known to you. You just don't want to let me slip away. True, I don't. But I spoke honestly, my dear. I swear. You say that everything has its barriers. But to me everything appears to be submission, as though I were a puny commoner at the feet of my master. 
even if my master is the design of the gods. Must I, Oct Octavia Milanidas, submit and endure? No, I'll find another way. But you're right about one thing. That's enough theology for today. Carry me to the bedroom, and quickly, before I change my mind. We spend the night caressing each other, delighting in idleness and pleasure. Nothing can disturb us tonight. Not the Archduke, not the Lords, not even the Twin Gods themselves. That is the best thing in life. To embrace the woman you love and spend a single night in pleasures of the flesh. What more can one ask from the gods? Nice. Our romance with Octavia unfolds uh, in a very pleasant manner, I must say. The Emperor's heirs in danger. Mm, this um, event is not that important, actually. Uh, and, like, it, it can... Uh, pay off in some endings, but uh, basically the Supreme Chancellor of the Empire, Agarius Monroe, um, the Great Chancellor of, of, of Empire, um, has offered sh uh, shelter to the heirs of the throne, uh, Princess uh, Jerian and Flavius, uh, but some people are afraid that uh, they are not so much uh, under protection, but they are held uh, hostages uh, to um, put a pressure on the Emperor. Okay. All hope for free... F ah, that's why it's important. All hope for reform in the Empire has vanished. From farmer to rich industrialist, the commoners are growing desperate. Yeah, I understand. Uh, Monroe uh, is using his influence to suppress any reforms. In my province, the authorities are trying their best to put the people at ease. The magistrate of Anizot makes a speech from the, his balcony to the excited crowd below. No, Remiel Verman basically says that everything is fine, everything is going according to plan, trust in your emperor, good people, uh, the imperial heirs are gonna be fine, blah blah blah. Oh no, oh no, not good, wealth of Magra drops further, struggle for power. Peace time ends soon, uh, not really, we still have uh, plenty of scenes to go, but... Uh, we should examine possible chapter endings to, ch to check which way we are headed. Uh, it's fairly obvious that we are headed uh, towards this. Uh, try to bring Otten uh, to the court of honor. Yeah, we, we closed this door, so yeah. The search for evidence. I am walking up the marble stairs that lead to the doors of the prefecture. The sword of a younger twin carved from stone looms above the doors, just as the case of Doris Otten now looms over me. Preparing this case will take many long months or even years. Yeah. And time and again I ask myself, I, am I ready to see this case through to the end? I think I am. Uh, more or less. Uh, father meets me at the stairs. Okay. Son, I didn't want to discuss this back home. Elborn is our friend, and I stand by him at all times, but he's dragged you into something that is far too dangerous. Oh, thank you, father. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I'm not going to repeat your grandfather's mistakes, so I won't tell my son how to live his life or what to do. But I ask you to please consider our family. Would it be worth it to let us come to harm, even if the triumph of justice and law is at stake? There are already rumors at the prefecture. They say you are getting ready to summon a highborn Arknian to court. You and I are both Brantes. Perhaps we ought to stay away from something so dangerous. Some battles are too ugly for us to win. You can always slow down the process and bide your time with routine paperwork, avoid attracting unwanted attention. This way your career and our family honor would not be at risk. Trust me in this, son. Rather than making a selfless sacrifice, we can achieve far more through tireless service for the good of the law. Our father is a little bit of a coward here, but he does not know that I made this dishonorable deal with Elverman and my career is beyond secure. Like, I can uh, afford uh, taking risks now, because I have uh, patronage of Elverman. Anyway, um... Father, I will consider your words. And now I am at a crossroads. If I am to make any headway in the case against Totten, I have to start now. Okay, uh, the thing is, we still don't have any evidence 
of Otton's crimes against his uh, legionnaires. Uh, Thomas could be the key to the entire case uh, if he can help me find the other men who have suffered under Otton, but Thomas is a hunted man and he has every reason to lay low and steer clear of the courthouse. Yeah. Uh, I could gather evidence myself, but uh, the Legion may meet a lone outsider with too much resistance. Things might get ugly. The thing is, we can uh, bring Otten down if we have another powerful Arknian on our side. Gaius Tempest, the Imperial Overseer of Magra, the Emperor's brother. Every aristocrat in the province knows he detests Dorius Otton for remaining loyal to Archduke Milanidas. Ensuring his support would increase my authority and give me a chance to gather evidence against Otton, without Thomas lifting a finger. But the Imperial Overseer is one step above the Prefect, and uh, basically I can only address him if I keep it a secret from Elborn. Mm, it would mean defying my loyalty to Elborn again, and uh, start uh, working directly with the Overseer and for the Overseer, I imagine. Okay. Oh, we actually can't ask Thomas why. Oh, I see. Because he does not uh, trust us enough. I I'm sorry. Uh, so, the thing is, uh, uh, w if we ask Thomas to help me gather evidence, Thomas... Uh, will be in danger once again. So, for example, if we somehow manage to rescue Thomas in previous scene, like strike uh, this deal with Otten, convince Thomas to leave the Legion, uh, if we ask Thomas to uh, help us, he will be in danger immediately. Like, uh, we, uh, it, it is, this means that uh, we can't rescue Thomas and then uh, use him as a key witness. And moreover, all options, uh, all the options to save Thomas to protect Thomas that uh, our connection with Elborn has offered us, uh, included uh, that Thomas Guerra would be in hiding. But if Thomas is in hiding, we can't uh, use him to get evidence against Totem. He must not be in hiding for us to ask him. So, what I'm trying to understand, it, for example, if we uh, remain uh, loyal to Elborn, mm, our only options uh, to gather evidence against Totem and not betray him, because uh, asking Overseer Gaius is uh, considered a betrayal of Elborn, uh, our only options is to put our best friend in danger or, yeah, die a lesser death. And the other option is don't waste our time, uh, blah blah blah, basically do nothing and uh, sit and wait for something. Oh, well, um... That is interesting. So basically, even if we uh, had used some options uh, to protect Thomas uh, using our connection with Elborn, we wouldn't have been able uh, to uh, ask him now for help. Great. So the lesson we learned today, kids, is this. Working for Elborn sucks. Working for, for Elborn is jumping from one foot to another constantly. <laughs> he's a good man, he's a decent man, but I think he's a very bad prefect. He uh, tackles this Otten case very clumsily. However, uh, as we have already betrayed Elborn, it would not make much difference to ask Overseer Gaius for support. Our reputation is good enough, and that's what we're gonna do. Okay, um, the Imperial Overseer should pay heed to my letter if uh, my interests happen to align with his. And they do. The reputation of the Brante family among the nobility of Magra is high enough to make Gaius Tempest at least consider a petition from me. Uh, we are known as a respected and hospitable family. We respect the Imperial law, we respect the noble traditions of valor, honor and hospitality. I compose the letter to Gaius Tempest. Um, through subtle hints, I inform the Overseer that I might be useful to him in establishing order in the province as he sees fit, and neutralizing his opposition. Mm -hmm. I mean Otton, of course. I am ready and willing to gather evidence that will implicate Dorus Otton in treason. 
All I need is the authority to represent the Overseer in this matter. Uh, to my surprise, the Overseer's reply arrives just a few days later. George Brante, your eagerness to serve the, the Overseer is praiseworthy indeed. One does not doubt the good intentions of a Brante family, whose reputation precedes them. The future of the Empire rests upon the shoulders of young nobles such as yourself. As the Supreme Commander of Magra, I cannot condone such lawless behavior in my legion. It is your duty to investigate the legion officer tainted by such allegations, and no one may interfere with the performance of the duty. You will soon receive a document to the effect that you represent the interests of the Imperial Overseer in this investigation. However, do not make haste to publicize any evidence you might gather. This matter is too delicate to act recklessly. You will receive word when the time is right. From this moment on, Sir Brante, the Imperial Overseer holds you personally responsible for this endeavor. Ooh. Ooh, we are starting to circle in some high places. Hmm. Okay, uh, with my authority expanded, I begin the investigation. The fate of Gaius Tempest is enough to open doors and make people talk. No official employed by the Imperial Legion can refuse an inquiry made with the Overseer's authority. Okay, so we learn the names of several Legion officers who, who have already met a lesser death in a duel with Otton. All of them nobles of the mantle, ennobled recently, young and full of potential to serve the good of the Empire. None of them are eager to speak of the duel, all of them are anxious to avoid getting challenged again. Mm -hmm. They finally agree to have their statements committed to ink and paper, so they are gathering testimonies. And written testimonies. Okay, uh, I reassure them again and again that their testimony will put an end to Otten's murderous rampage. What I am trying to do is to get Otten dishonorably discharged and strip of all ranks and power. The statements of the legionnaires paint a picture. There is a method to Otten's madness. All of the officers disobeyed the commander at least once or expressed their disagreement, no matter how respectfully. So, like Thomas did. He refused to burn the village down, so Otten challenged him. Mm -hmm. More and more officers are starting to realize that Otten's loyalty lies with Archduke Milanides and not his lawful superior, the Overseer. So, more and more officers are getting challenged by Otten. So, Otten's duels have gone beyond his passion for sword fighting. They are also an excuse to eliminate any suspicion of his treason. Bastard. The relatives of officers who have met true death in a duel are the hardest to convince. Widows, mothers, fathers. They all say the same thing with the same grim expression. They have nothing to complain about, nothing can be done anymore. The officer met his death in the line of duty. That is all. But I am persistent. And eventually I persuade them to admit that their husbands and relatives all met their end at Otton's hands. Horrible. Horrible. Okay, I begin to notice a trend. None of these duels were sanctioned or monitored by the court of honor. And noble traditions demand that every sword fight be sanctioned by noble society and overseen by a representative of the court of honor. As far as I remember, any uh, prominent noble of a sort can be uh, such representative. But uh, like I said before uh, in the previous episode, um, the presence of uh, a third party, uh, basically a judge from the court of honor, some esteemed noble of a sort from this province, is absolutely necessary. So Otten thinks himself above even the noble traditions of old. Dishonorable to the bone. The once thin folder against Otten grows fatter by the day, as I write down every instance and incident, every name, every circumstance. I have gathered many testimonies against him. One day, Prefect Alborn pays me a visit to see my progress firsthand. I show him the results, but wisely refrain from mentioning the aid I have received from Gaius Tempest. All the loyalty I have sworn to the Overseer in return. You've done great work, Brent. I am quite surprised you've managed to gather all this evidence on your own. I think uh, for myself, like, uh, because in, con in contrast to you, I am actually a good judge who knows how to do his job. Commander Otten isn't even bothering to cover his tracks, I must say. This evidence alone would be enough to indict anyone. Anyone, save for an Arcanian nobleman, sadly. So your work here is far from over. I see you realize that. 
The way things stand right now, summoning an Arcanian to trial in a court of law would indict us rather than him. It would be best to postpone the case for now, but keep the folder safe and secure. Actually, I do not understand why Elborn doesn't even consider the option of bringing Otan uh, before the court of honor. I understand that he doesn't approve of duels and he doesn't approve of these ancient traditions, but for now, uh, for this point in history, why not? It will still save lives, it will still uh, strip uh, this bastard uh, of all power, he will be dishonorably discharged. Why not? You can uh, uh, get better laws for commoners a little bit later. For right now, uh, removing Otten from power is the more pressing concern. Okay, nonetheless. Uh, for now, Sir Brandt, I return to your other duties and pay particular attention to any dueling incidents. We will take our next step against Sir Otten when the time is right. Okay, Gaius Tempest now likes us better. And we betray Elborn for a second time. Jesus. Poor Elborn. Evidence against Ottan. Uh, we now have the evidence we need to bring Dorius Otten to trial, and this means that our career requirement for... Uh, Otten faces the Court of Honor ending uh, are reduced by 1, so we don't need to have a career at 8, we only need it at 7. Bare minimum. Nice. Stefan's Gambit. Huh? Interesting. Okay, um... Tonight I come home extremely late, but the fireplace in the sitting room is lit. By the fire, I see Stefan with a glass of wine. Wine. My elder brother has been waiting for me. I take a seat. Bran. We need to have a talk about Gloria. Okay, let's have a talk. She flatly refuses to behave as she ought to. Her antics are ruining our family's reputation. If this situation persists, nobility of a sort will be out of the question. Brother. I do not wish her ill. But we have no right to sit idly by, idly by. Regrettably, Gloria will never truly be a part of the Branta family. Her origins are too tarnished. So it is our duty to find her new family. It is high time Gloria got married. But we can't just give our sister to a commoner, can we? And how could any noble wed her knowing her origins? It's been a stumbling block for a long time, but I finally found a suitable match for her. His name is Jose El Pelletier. Oh, yeah, our former uh, fellow student uh, with whom we clashed uh, in the tournament. Yeah, uh, I also remember him from uh, uh, the reception several years back when he was swooning after Gloria. Okay, do you recall the reception? Yeah, do you recall the reception several years ago where he couldn't take his eyes off Gloria? Pelletier has been obsessed with her ever since. Not even her lowly origins can deter him. Admittedly, Gloria does not reciprocate his affection just yet. So, let us convince Gloria that becoming Sir El Pelletier's bride is her chance to escape her current situation. And then let us pray she comes to her senses and puts her rebellious ways behind her. Isn't this an ideal solution? After marrying El Pelletier, Gloria will be a noble woman herself. We will be granting her the freedom she is craved since she was a girl, and then she can write poetry and do whatever else takes her fancy. I will enter into negotiations with the El Pelletier family. Rumor has it Jose's father already has a future wife in mind for him, the daughter of an important chancellery official, but Jose's passion must win out in the end, don't you agree? As for you, Bran, please help me with Gloria. You are closest with her. You can make her see, her see how beneficial this match will be. She must fulfill her duty to the family that took her in, after all. Hmm. Okay, um... Okay, this is, uh, in my opinion, an extremely morally grey situation, because obviously this arranged marriage is not what Gloria wants right now, like, at all. She wants to be accepted as Brante, as a part of the family. She wants to get officially adopted, uh, we saw it, clear as day she wants to she wants her father her stepfather robert to uh, call her daughter officially however if we do so 
it will indeed ruin our chances uh, at uh, ennoblement by the sword. Any hope for it will be lost. And uh, harsh though it may be, uh, Bran doesn't think it's morally good and morally right to throw away the future of all our descendants just to satisfy one person's desire to be adopted. It is uh, selfish and foolish to do so. Um, like I said, obviously this decision is not morally good, morally perfect. It is an arranged marriage, it is a chauvinistic thing to do, it is uh, against Gloria's wishes. However, uh, as Bran understands this situation, Gloria needs a place to belong, a place to call home. A marriage with uh, a noble man who loves her as she is, who uh, upholds the principles of uh, noble honor, this is a good solution. Jose will love her and treat her well, I hope, and uh, she uh, will be free from the shackles of her common lot, which she hates. Not a perfect solution, but in Brand's opinion, the best one under the circumstances. Um, as much as I understand uh, that why Gloria doesn't want this, brother, uh, I think your plan sounds reasonable. In a new family and with a noble title, Gloria will be able to put all the resentment about her fate behind her. She will no longer be a bastard commoner with no name and no future. And uh, she will uh, find uh, a new place in the world, a new place to call home and a new calling in her life. Being a noble lady of a sort. She will be free of the limitations of a lowly estate. I am with you. I am on your side. A broad smile lights up his face as he reclines in his chair. I knew you'd be sensible. Together we can certainly make it happen. But remember how stubborn glory is. An easy victory is not to be expected. Indeed, brother. The next morning, I invite Gloria to join me in the library for a private conversation. Look, uh, sis, um, it bothers me greatly that uh, you are an adult woman and you still have no occupation in your life. Like, you have nothing to occupy yourself with, you... Uh, uh, suffer uh, under your lot and uh, you have nothing to aspire to. It saddens me deeply. Uh, did you consider the prospect of marriage? Uh, if a nobleman of a sort uh, were to wed you, you would join the noble estate and uh, all the arts would be open to you. Writing poetry, uh, opening uh, school for peasant kids, for example, if you want to. Have you considered this? Gloria laughs in response. <laughs> Become a noble woman. In all of Andizot, you would never find a single nobleman of a sort who would ever marry a lowborn girl like me. I don't even have a father. In fact, we have found one such nobleman. José El Pelletier. A very spirited young gentleman, I must say. Uh, I know him from my days uh, at uh, the college, uh, at uh, the Imperial College in Eterna, and uh, he is quite willing to join you in wedlock. Marielle Pelletier? <laughs> Brian, you don't understand. Sure, he is easy on the eyes. He is a skilled warrior and a respected nobleman, but he's been after me for a year now, and I have managed to figure out what he's after. He needs a wife to give birth to his heirs, follow him around obediently at social gatherings, and praise his chivalry. Can you see me in that role? Mm, I understand, I see where you're coming from, but uh, don't you think that uh, this role is better than no role at all? Like, right now, uh, you don't have a proper place in the world. And it is very sad, because you are smart and uh, uh, spirited and uh, funny and charming. You should have a better life. And in my opinion, sis, um, Gloria interrupts me. I don't even want to be a noble woman, okay? 
I can't just live peacefully within the noble estate knowing that other commoners are still suffering. I can't just pretend their misery has nothing to do with me. Uh, but look, uh, I understand uh, you feel compassion towards your fellow commoners, but uh, being a noble lady uh, will give you more opportunities to help uh, the commoners and ease their sufferings than you have right now. Like, uh, what can you do to um, ease their burden now? As a noble lady, you can open uh, shelters or give money to charity, anything you want. Uh, write inspiring uh, poems for them, like anything that takes your fancy. But my sister doesn't even want to hear me. This is all Stefan's idea, isn't it? You would never throw me out of the house on your own. So here is. It's not going to happen. I don't want to throw you out of the house of Gloria. Ah. Uh, <sighs> this is gonna be hard. I inform Stefan of my sister's refusal. His face turns to stone. The ingrate. I've almost come to an agreement with old Tail Pelletier. All the pains we've taken to arrange her future and this is how she repays us. Well, we'll proceed without consulting her. Brother, we need to devise a way to put pressure on Gloria, even if it takes us a long time. Okay, Stefan likes us better, uh, we have entered a secret plot with him. Fortunately, Gloria does not worsen her opinion on us. Huh? Oh! Oh! An audience with the Overseer. Makes sense. We have used the Overseer's help to gather evidence against Otan, and now he summons us. Okay, recent events have strengthened our position even further. My authority among the judges is unchallenged. There is talk in noble circles to the effect that a nobleman with such respect for honor and tradition would be ideal for the post of prefect. I understand that a big part of this uh, uh, of this uh, improvement uh, is uh, my deal with Remy Elverman, but also if we look at uh, the track record of Bran Branta, he is not that bad a judge. I even managed to get the Protector of the People uh, event, uh, and uh, uh, justice is reasonably uh, high uh, in our province, thanks to me. Okay, nonetheless. I receive a letter early in the morning. The seal on the envelope is that of the Imperial Tempest Dynasty. Oh, Gaius Tempest himself, the overseer of the province, has summoned me to an audience with him. I am to head for his headquarters at the castle of Enery at once. Okay, I send for a tailor and purchase a new suit in the latest fashion. I also go to the barber and make sure my appearance is impeccable. I'm finally to meet uh, uh, one uh, member of a ruling estate I respect the most. Like, I have great respect for Gaius Tempest and I hope he will win in this struggle against Archduke Milanidas, because I think Gaius Tempest is going to be a far uh, more just and uh, wise ruler than uh, Archduke. Okay, the journey to Enery is not a short one. Uh, the overseer of Magra himself wishes to see me in person. Hmm, why? Five days, five days later, oh, I arrive at my destination. The estate of Enery is remarkably prosperous for the, for the desiccated province of Magra. Gaius Tempest's home has a truly Arknian flair. Where is it located, actually? Where, 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 where? Oh, there it is. Nice. The headquarters of Gaius Tempest. Mm-hmm. Okay. A massive stronghold surrounded by imposing walls. It is set upon a rocky ledge and encircled by a moat with a stone bridge across it. Cool. I am expected to present myself for an audience by noon. I enter study. It is quite modestly decorated, by Arknian standards. The most powerful Arknian in Magra is sitting at his desk, penning some ordinances. After finishing another line, he notices me. He has not changed since the time I saw him on the balcony of the Imperial Palace, because Arknians uh, age much slower than humans. He stands before me. Well, it's more like I stand before him. I offer a gracious bow. He accepts my greeting with a favorable nod. I've heard of your family, Sir Bran Brante. Nobles of a mantle for two generations only. And already such recognition among noble society. Your work as a judge deserves respect as well. It seems you know how to choose your friends and allies. 
I am flattered by your appreciation, my lord. My principal allies, however, are the law and my loyalty to the Empire. Actually, that's an, uh, this is uh, not a simple pleasantry for Bran, that is true. I try to uh, uphold the law whenever possible and I am very loyal to the Empire. At least to the reasonable parts of the Empire of reasonable rulers. A faint green passes over Gaius Tempest features. Just as I thought. But one of those who must be your allies, Sir Elborn, has disappointed me of late. Yeah, me too. Please understand what I mean, Brante. My prefect is a talented and honest judge. But alas, he is also myopic. Absolutely true. Absolutely agree. Myopic. And acts too hastily. Also agree. Firm power is needed to bring a positive change to the province. As for Elborn's escapades, he is playing with fire by expanding the rights of the lowborn and aggravating the nobility. Change is out of the question as long as my legitimate authority in Magra can be challenged by that serpent Milanides and his enterer. Because of his schemes, half of the old nobility have turned against me. The other half are people like Ramiel Vermin who do not know what true loyalty is. Squanderers like him never stay with the same master or ally for long. His only goal is to destroy his enemies, no matter the cost. Um, I uh, wisely refrain from uh, telling that I am uh, an ally of Ramiel Vermin because I uh, think that we are not uh, allies. We are more like temporary partners, because I understand what Guy's Tempest is saying. Remy Elverman is not to be trusted. But let us return to the question I brought you here to discuss. I am aware that you have begun legal proceedings against Commander Otten. Yeah, he, obviously he knows, because I have gathered evidence uh, with his help. Otten is among those who have chosen the wrong side in my dispute with the Archduke. I will not object if this impudent youth pays for his stubbornness. But please, remember his noble blood. I cannot allow a highborn Arknion to be judged by the same court that reviews the petty grievances of a lowborn. There are certain traditions that must remain inviolable. The case will not be adjudicated by the prefecture. Otten must be handed over to a noble court of honor. It is not a question of justice. By killing my legion soldiers, Otten has insulted me personally. In a court of honor, I will be able to deal with him properly, Arknion to Arknion. But only if you, Branta, can gather sufficient proof and occupy such a position that not only I, but all the other nobles must heed your advice. I need a personal ally at the prefecture. If you prove to be useful to me, you will become a member of the entourage of Overseer Gaius of the Tempest. In order to give you a free hand, I will order you to be promoted to the rank of Senior Judge. If I understand correctly, a Senior Judge is one step below the Prefect. The Prefect is like the Supreme Judge who runs all the Prefecture, and a Senior Judge is one step below him. You have already shown yourself to be worthy of the title. But remember, you are henceforth loyal to me personally, and not to Prefect Alborn. He gestures to a sealed envelope on his desk. This is the decree ordering your promotion. But remember that Otten must not stand trial in a prefecture court. The only judgment awaiting him is my own. May I assume that we are clear, Sir Brante? Am I willing to accept his proposal? Yes. Yes. Finally, I, I can work with uh, an authority figure I trust and respect. And not some... Pfft. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna become a senior judge. I'm gonna finally obtain an unshakable power in the prefecture. And I'm gonna show Elborn how wrong he has been to dismiss noble traditions and to uh, frown and scoff at me uh, for using my power to help ours. I will show him. I will, I will show this old man. And I will show Remy Elverman as well. He will see, he will see what I am capable of. Nonetheless, I have no moral objections against bringing Otten to the Court of Honor. And I see no moral objections in uh, allowing Gaius Tempest, as the supreme ruler of a province, to deal with Otten as he sees fit. I totally understand where he is coming from. 
I guess it's an arch archaic uh, worldview to uh, not not to desire an Arknian to be judged by the court of law, but I understand that. Arknians are to be judged uh, in the court of honor by uh, their ancestors. Fair enough. I bow my head. I uh, graciously accept your generous gift, my lord. I will carry out all your orders. You can count on me to fight against your enemies by word and deed. Gaius Tempest reclines in his chair with a satisfied air. I expected nothing less. You have risen high, Brante. You have the patronage of a noble Arknion from the Tempest family. Do not let me down. Why does everyone keep telling me this? Do not let me down. Do not let me down. No, you do not let me down. <laughs> Everybody has expectations for me. Even dead dudes like my grandfather. Nonetheless, don't let me down. Otten must fall. Gather evidence and prepare your case. But remember your place in this affair. It is a dispute between two Arknians, not a human trial. I understand my place perfectly fine, my lord. Your judgment is the final judgment. You are the supreme ruler of the province, and uh, I am at your service. It is time for a midday meal. You will depart first thing tomorrow, but you will spend the night in the castle. Hey, I leave one is out the next morning. Rumors about my audience with the overseer make their way through every noble household. Becoming a senior judge is a big deal. Prefect Alborn receives the news of my promotion with the utmost surprise, I can imagine, but fulfills Gaius Tempest's request without any objection. <laughs> a promotion is an occasion that calls for celebration. Uh, okay, my grandfather Gregor Brante is the only other member of a family to hold such a lofty position at the prefecture. The celebration attracts all of Anizot High Society. Among the other guests, Magistrate El Verman pays me a visit. Oh, you double-faced little weasel. Hello and welcome. The celebration is in full swing when Remy El Verman takes the stage. My dear Bran, allow me to congratulate you on becoming a senior judge. I am glad to see this post filled by a real nobleman who has respect for our traditions. You may not have been born a nobleman, but you have become one. But you mustn't rest on your laurels. Instead of truly dispensing justice, many judges prefer to interfere with the lives of Anizot's most esteemed citizens. Persecute nobles, basically. I'm sure you'll find a way to put them in their place. A toast to new heights for Senior Judge Brante. The seat reserved for Prefect Elborn is empty. He has chosen not to come at all. Elborn hates us now. Okay, I have risen high, but the higher the ascent, the more deadly the fall. Otten's case has turned into something more, a struggle for power in the province. I am just a minor figure in this game between the Overseer and the Archduke. I must be careful. With that thought I empty my glass, but what is really important is that I have chosen my side. I firmly support Gaius Tempest in his desire to punish Otten according to the traditions of old. I think it's a noble and brave uh, desire. An interesting fact is that Gaius Tempest, uh, in contrast to Elborn, is ready to put his own life on the line because uh, he he wants to face Otten in a duel in the Court of Honor, uh, and this duel is to true death, of course. So Gaius Tempest is uh, willing to fight to true death with his own enemy to strip him of power. Elborn is not that brave. I I like this bravery and this noble valor in Gaius Tempest. Okay, Augustine Elborn is thrice betrayed by us. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, career plus two. Uh, tyranny of the nobles. Eh, we'll see about that. I am not some puppet on the string. You'll see. A realm unknown. The sun is setting on a cold windy day as I return from the prefecture. A messenger awaits me at the door with an urgent letter from Sir Elborn. Brant, there is an urgent case that I must entrust to you. We have just received a report of a secret society formed by young nobles. The Archduke's family may be involved. This concerns me. I suspect a possible plot to depose Overseer Tempest. Normally, the secret chancellor handles all such cases, but I'd rather investigate the rumors of the plot before there is any action. 
Preventing unnecessary bloodshed and disgrace would be prudent. You ought to investigate this matter as soon as possible. Okay, uh, so he says that uh, the gender struck down a suspicious nobleman, uh, a meeting will be held tonight, uh, and uh, we are about to enter it in secret. Nice. All members of the secret society wear masks, so uh, we have acquired this nobleman's personal mask, and I am to attend the meeting tonight and learn as much as possible about this secret society. Nice. <laughs> The mask fit, fits my face perfectly. Mm. A secret gathering, interesting. I like secret gatherings. I have been to several secret gatherings, in fact, mm -hmm. in my life. Okay, um, I come at the appointed hour to an inconspicuous mansion on the edge of Anizot. The gatekeepers bow and open the gate as soon as they see me. Inside the yard I see noble carriages, many more than I had expected. Okay, a change of clothes awaits me inside. It's a curious garb, a square of flowing, sparkling cloth with clasps and cords to keep it from unwrapping. Weird, strange rope and a gilded masks. mask. Hmm. This satire feels positively unsuitable for any kind of plotting and scheme. Indeed it does. Uh, maybe there is a sexual orgy in order? <laughs> okay. I proceed to a large room. The windows are covered in black cloth to keep prying eyes away, but I forget about it moments later. I hear droning, unfamiliar music coming seemingly from nowhere. I see candlelight dancing and glimmering, ribbons of gold and silver are hung along the walls as decorations. And there are people, many people. Like me, they are dressed in flowing robes and delicate gilded masks. The people are talking. They stand unexpectedly close to one another. Um, hmm. I put a hand on another person's forearm. Masked people seem friendly and genial. No one appears surprised uh, by my insecurity. All their conversations are also quite out of the ordinary. I hear unfamiliar names. Names that could belong to legendary heroes of old or to the people here who have taken them as secret identities. Their conversations feel like a strange dream. I hear several voices singing in the far off corner of the room. Together, these voices form a tender, softly aching melody with no lyrics. It feels enrapturing. It spirits me away. I feel so distant now from the purpose of my visit, so withdrawn from the judges' trade, so far away from the Empire and from my very self. Weird. Some mystical shit is going on. A hand touches my shoulder, bringing me back to my senses. A pair of familiar eyes look at me intently from behind the glinting greenish silver mask. They belong to Octavia. I bow to the Archduke's daughter. I believe I recognize the man behind this mask. I never expected to see you here today, my extraordinary human. But I must behave here. You'd do best you'd best do the same. We are not alone. It would be best if we are not seen too close to one another. As for this place, Sir Brante, allow me to explain. This is my circle of Latari. And before you ask, no, we do not plot, nor do we scheme. We have removed ourselves as far as possible from such machinations. So, medieval hippies then? This place is a little world of our own. A brief respite from tradition and noble customs and other such fuss. Our gathering is but a pretense, a game of make-believe. We pretend we are neither nobles nor citizens of a blessed empire, no humans nor Archeans, but the Latari. Do you know what this word means? Long before us, in an age when this land was fertile and green, the Latari lived upon the land that would become Magra. They were masters of a remarkable art, they could create worlds from nothing but their conscious mind. Uh, what a story, Mark. <laughs> what a story, Octavia. <laughs> Many of these people come here for simple entertainment and a brief taste of freedom. Others seek a respite from the binding customs of a noble lot. Still others feel encumbered by the blood tides and the ancestral obligations. Only here are we fully free from the burden of our past and our present. Yet some among us see more than, seek more than brief moments of freedom. They are drawn here by a fascination with the Latari and the idea that our entire existence can be shaped by the mind alone. We strive to know the Latari people for ourselves. We strive to continue their teachings. We strive to become them. 
If we happen to master the art of shaping walls from our own minds, we may yet break free of the trap that is this harsh existence. Okay, um, Octavia, I'm sorry to ask, but do you know that the rituals of extinct, the extinct races are held in the same regard as magic and punishable as such? Octavia takes off her golden mask and reveals a slight smile on her once hidden face. Uh, oh, a poem, okay. May your voice ne'er speak words of deceit. To great shame lies the path of untruth. Where an Arknian lies, where a human denies, the Lataris speak truly, forsooth. I'm not afraid. The truth of a Latari matters more to me than any persecution. You came here in secret, which means the Prefecture has taken an interest in my little gatherings. But I am confident you will describe this as an innocent club of young nobles and keep our fragile world from prying eyes and ears. Would you do this for me, Bran Brante? Mm. Okay. <sighs> this gathering is in violation of the law. All rituals of extinct races were banned at the foundation of the Empire, like an unholy, like unholy uh, arts, magic, basically. I may summon the Jedarms here at any moment, but mm, Octavia will never forgive me. Not good. I keep the Circle of Latari a secret from Elborn, but uh, if the Secret Chancellor ever takes interest in these meetings, I will be powerless. Someone has reported Octavia's Circle to the Prefecture, there is a very good chance these reports will continue. It's only a matter of time uh, before the Secret Chancellor intervenes. Hmm. However, I could make the circle into a noble historical society, with a piece of paper, some ink and a bit of skill. One of many dozen in Anzot alone. Legitimized by the city, Octavia's gatherings would remain a secret within this mansion. Would it be wise to expand my influence in this way? Say it something, I think, Bran. This is no time to be quiet. The great mystery of Latari is about to begin. Okay, what can we do? We can keep the secret and participate in the Latari ritual, but it will drop uh, our justice, naturally. Uh, we can ban the circle of Latari. Uh, it will improve justice, but uh, drop our reputation and Octavia will hate us. We love her enough to not do this. We can convince Octavia to disband the circle, she trusts us enough. It, once again, will improve justice, but she will, still will be somewhat disappointed if we insist that she must disband the society for her own good. Or we can legitimize the circle, we are powerful enough to do so, because uh, we have both high enough diplomacy and patronage of the powerful, we are friends with Remiel Vermin, well, friend, partners. We find a way to help the circle of Latari continue to exist as a historical society. It does not influence justice in either way, because we basically... we. We can make this illegal act legal, like in Star Wars, but what about uh, uh, love, uh, love uh, my lord? I will make it legal. Is it legal, my lord? I will, I will make it legal. Yeah, we will make, make it legal. Mm. Octavia will like us better. Uh, we can get a point of wealth from this. So I'm deciding between these two options. Convince Octavia to disband the circle peacefully or legitimize the circle. Hmm. Well, hmm, interesting. Well, truth be told, uh, Bran Brante holds a soft spot for uh, secret societies, like the Marken Society and such, uh, and uh, we are already breaking the law with Octavia because we are having a secret affair, uh, and uh, uh, any such affairs between humans and Arknians are prohibited by traditions of old, so what's the fuss? I think it's uh, more important uh, for Bran to make Octavia happy, Octavia happy when it is to uh, uphold the law once again. So, yeah. <laughs> How quaint, my lady. A group of nobles hiding from sight wearing masks studying the culture of a long dead race. Have you never considered taking your historical studies a bit more seriously, my lady? Octavia's eyes narrow, trying to discern the meaning behind your wor my words. Look, uh, there is a way to make the meetings of a circle fully legitimate. 
I have enough influence to get the papers you need and uh, have them signed by the right people, including my old pal, Magistrate Elverman, who, bastard though he may be, uh, did far more for me than Elborn ever did. Yeah. So, uh, I, sorry, I digress. So, what do you say, my lady? Octavia's face lights up. Indeed. Uh, my dear Sir Brant, welcome to a meeting of our Imperial Historical Society. Surely you would be so kind as to procure us a proper plaque for the door? Indeed, my lady. I will. With a genial smile, Octavia extends her hand to me. I kiss it gently. If only we were alone so I could show you the full extent of my gratitude. But the great mystery of the night is about to begin. You should leave us. You will bring danger upon the circle if you are seen coming here again. You'd best get those papers prepared right away, kind brand. The members of the circle are already gathering in the middle of the room, ready to begin their mysterious ritual. Uh, but we will not begin until I leave the circle. Ha ha ha! I am not invited to the party. La 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 la. Following Lady Octavia's suggestion, I change into my normal clothes and leave the mansion. Okay. Sorrel born, uh, I tell the next day, uh, there was no sign whatsoever of any noble plot. The group is nothing but a historical society run by several young nobles, including the Archduke's daughter, who meet to discuss the cultures of old. A very uh, noble pursuit, if you ask me, to study history, to study antiquity. It's a good thing to learn. They simply lack legitimacy. But we can rectify that. Mm, this sounds suspicious, Brante, and the Archduke's daughter is involved. I hope you know what you're doing. Either way, I'm glad we didn't stick the gendarmes on them. I hope the Secret Chancellery and Sir Alfero... Who is Sir Alfero? Ah, the guy from the Secret Chancellery, yeah. I never learn of those reports. I doubt the advisor would be as tolerant of their youthful amusements. Yeah, they are gonna be fine. Because uh, this society will have all the permits they need to operate without arousing suspicion. And so the Anisot Historical Society for the Study of Ancient Peoples is founded. The city hall wastes no time approving the necessary paperwork, because every official there knows that Judge Brante is a respectable gentleman with friends in high places. So this is what power feels like. Just snap of my fingers and uh, I form a new society and save these young people from further trouble and make my beloved happy. Mmm, the taste of power. It tastes good. My busy parents pay no heed to the follies of young nobles. Octavia sends me her reward in the form of a letter. When I open the envelope to read it, a gilded key clings onto the floor. Bran, I am impressed by your abilities. You know how to use your connections and bring me joy. It pleases me to know that I was right about you. A chest matching this key will be delivered to your estate tonight. Farewell, Baran. It will be some time before we meet again. I have much to do on my own. Mm, it says here that I cannot help but think of Octavia and those who followed her they have dared to reject their nature, lot and birth in an attempt to become something else entirely. But. I think no harm will come uh, of it, like uh, ancient magic, blah blah, I don't believe uh, this. Like, I felt something weird when I entered the mansion, but uh, I hope uh, it will bring Octavia some amusement and uh, ease the burden of her lot. She seems very distraught about her lot, her destiny, her obligations. I hope she feels better. As for Octavia and her circle of flattery, I hear nothing of them for a long time. After that night, the Archduke's daughter seems to vanish from the social circles of Anisot. My encounters with her have ended as abruptly as they had begun. Still, affection from Lady Octavia. She loves us dearly. We made her very happy indeed. Nice. Oh, and the point of wealth. We are very affluent. Yoo-hoo. Alright, moving on. I really like the taste of power. The last straw. Rumors are running wild in Anizot. 
People say that a mysterious clandestine society called the Last Straw holds the entirety of the city's seedy underbelly in its clutches, with men and safe houses all over Anisot plotting and scheming against the nobles and the rulers of the province. Their leader is a woman, a ruthless criminal by the name of Sophia. Oh. I wished to meet Sophia again and I wished for her to find her own path, but I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> okay, she has evaded all attempts at capture. The common people both fear the last straw and sympathize with the cause. If the rumors are true, the city finally has someone who will stop at nothing to help the people claim their rights. But who would support this secret organization? And how did the insurgents manage to survive this long? No one in the city knows the answers. Magistrate Elverman must assuage the people's fears once again. The vile mutineers and heretics who call themselves the last straw will be caught and executed very soon, and anyone who has given them money and shelter will meet the same fate. A secret chancellery will make sure of it. Remy Elverman should have become a modern Russian politician. He is very good at lying to people's faces and uh, uh, intimidating them instead of calming them down. The last straw still endures. Slowly but surely, the influence of this underground organization is spreading throughout the city. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Order drops down to unrest and wealth of Magra drops down to misery and devastation. Oh my god. Not good. We live in troubled times. Indeed. What? Oh, oh, why, 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 why? Why? We need a firm hand to rule this province. This shit can't go on like this. Like We, we need to establish a strong uh, power structure and finally start to make some reforms. Like This shit can't go on. Threats and promises. Huh. I am in the middle of ascending the city hall's long curved marble staircase. A small man beneath the building's towering vault. Uh, so Magistrate L. Verman has summoned me here. Okay, I am already expected. I enter the spacious room that is the office of El Verman. I find him sitting in his comfortable chair of carved wood. He acknowledges my presence with a nod. However, he is not alone. By the window of the office stands a tall Arknian, Torius Sotum. Oh. He does not even bother to look around and to turn around and look at me. The magistrate gestures to me formally, beckoning me closer. Judge Brante, you have come at last. Sir Otten has been eagerly awaiting your arrival. You see, the commander has learned about a litigation being prepared against him at the prefecture. He demanded that an end be put to these machinations at once. And I humbly offered him my assistance. Oh, you little weasel. You are in cahoots with him. Mm. Slowly Otten turns to face me. He eyes me with cold contempt. Brante, you again? Again? I don't believe we have met formally before. So, ah, we, we have. I have been Thomas II in uh, his duel with Otto. So, you've been chosen to oversee this so-called case against me. I don't envy you. I will be brief. I will not stand idly by in the face of slander and baseless accusations. Give me your word of honor as a nobleman that you will do everything in your power to put a stop to this litigation. Only then will you be free to leave. Um, and if I refuse? I will treat any other answer as an insult against my noble lineage. And let it be known that Sir Elverman holds many positions, such as the chairman's seat at the court of honor, which means that any insult will be soon followed by a legitimate duel of honor. I'm sure you know full well how others have fared in duels against me. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. Uh, what option is unlocked? Give Otten my word. Drops both my career and justice. Not good. Not good. I'm not gonna yield before this shithead. I am firmly on Gaius Tempest's side and this bastard is going down. However, I can't put Otten at ease. I can't uh, lie to him because my manipulation isn't good enough and Dorius Otten uh, doesn't treat me well enough. I see. I can retaliate against Otten, stand my ground and force him to back down. It uh, will even improve my reputation, but uh, it will also cost me a life. I will die a second death. Mm, too costly. 
mm, not a good deal. Like uh, uh, to sacrifice my whole lesser life uh, when it might be needed in the future, only to get a point of reputation and uh, what else? A point of valor? No, not good. And what is this? Oh, six environments protection. We have his patronage, uh, and uh, I can call in this favor in exchange for his protection. Hmm. I think that's what I'm gonna do. Time to put this connection to good use. Hmm. I'm facing true death and ruin for my family, and I am not going to take any risks just yet. To retaliate besides would be stupid, because we, me and Guy's Tempest, we are preparing a secret plot to bring Otten down. He must not suspect anything, he, he must still think that uh, his case um, is going uh, uh, to the prefecture, that he's about to be, uh, to be put on trial in the court of law. He must not know anything about the court of honor. So, I meet Otten's gaze and answer. This case uh, is no cause for concern, Sir Otten. I am a humble judge, simply doing my duty. And no one has any reason to blame me for any slander or false accusations. I am an honest judge, working for the good of the Empire and its noble representatives. Is that not so, Sir Magistrate? Elverman remains quiet at first. But then he shrugs, fighting back doubt, and finally rises from his seat slightly to address Otten. Sir Otten, my friend, uh, allow me to speak in favor of young Brandon. He is still young. He has not learned his place just yet. But he has already proven himself to be a worthy servant of the Empire. I can personally assure you that he will not permit any slander and will honorably quash any rumors that might tarnish your reputation. Give him time. Otten turns around, he looks at Elverman with distrust. I don't know what this human did to earn your favor. You had better be speaking the truth, Remy. So be it, Brenta. I'll give you time. Do not fail the magistrate he watched for you just now, and pray to the twins if I hear even a word of this so-called case ever again. I assure you, noble sir, that uh, under my uh, watch, on my watch, uh, everyone will get what they deserve, and uh, a nobleman who is honorable and uh, respectful towards our old traditions has nothing to fear. Otten quickly walks out of the magistrate's office. Elverman turns to me, shaking his head in disapproval. So, Berente, it appears you know how to make good use of your past achievements. But you should know that favor does not last forever, especially when your actions earn you the ire of Arknians who represent the pinnacle of our society. Be careful from now on, and heed Sir Otten's words. Believe me, he will know how you conduct these gates. Good night, Judge. Good night, Sir Magistrate. <laughs> yes, Otten's sword will continue to loom over me until his case come to an end, but for now I have made some good use uh, from our deal with Elverman. His influence protected me from further harm. Nice. Nobleman's honor. Okay, uh, as the strife between the estates grows more bitter, the judges' trade grows tougher by the day. The commoners demand more rights and legal protections, the nobles do their best to push back. As things stand right now, any verdict made in, co made in court may result in upheaval in the province and possibly determine the outcome of my case against Otto. One day, in a park by the Thales estate, favored by Duding and his nobles. I see a curly-haired young man lying prone in the small sunlit square. His body has been pierced by a sword. A true death. I am here to investigate a report of an illegal duel. The winner is still here, a slender middle-aged noble in an elegant black jacket. Surrounded by generals. Um, your orders, your honor? Sir Elgorwe will not submit on his own, and we wouldn't dare use force against him. It's okay, Lenat. I will uh, uh, resolve this matter. Mm -hmm. Elgorwe's eyes widen and his face comes to life when he notices me. It was a duel sanctioned by the Court of Honor, that is all. 
The late Sir L.S. questioned my loyalty to the Emperor and called me an apostate. He left me no other choice but to defend my honor, and now he is dead. Please be quick with your verdict, Sir Judge. I am expected at the capital. You do know who I am, don't you? Before I can say a single word, a carriage bearing the crest of Magistrate Alverman, of course, rolls through the gate. This guy <laughs> is stalking me. <laughs> okay, the Magistrate furrows his silvery brow as he looks at the sorrowful scene. He takes me aside for a moment. Brenda, as you know, I am the chairman of our city's court of honor. I refused to sanction this duel for as long as I could since true death was on the line. But Alan El Corve insisted that denying him would spell trouble for the city of Anizot. Regrettably, he is a small yet important person in the Emperor's court. He used to command the Emperor's personal guard. I realize that you must mete out justice as your duty demands. But remember, duels of honor are one of the cornerstones of Imperial tradition, one of the pillars that support the twin's divine vision for the Empire. You have the authority to punish El Corvo, but be careful, he might make a dangerous enemy both for yourself and for all the nobles of Anizot. But fool El Este didn't know this, and now he's lying there before us. We would be wise not to repeat his mistake. Hmm? Branda, the situation is far from ordinary. If the fate of your city means anything to you, it would be best to let Arikorvia go without a trial. Anizot doesn't need any trouble from the capital, and the LSs are not as strong as they used to be. Well, get through it. You may find him if you wish. Justice will be done, at least to some extent. <laughs> okay. Deep in thought, I gaze upon the body of the dead duelist and the long shadow of Arikorvia. Okay, let's see. Um... I can uh, heed Elverman's advice and find El Corvio, improve my career, worsen my justice. I can sentence El Corvio to capital punishment because I have Octavia's favor. I uh, can use her uh, patronage to have the murderer prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I can also legalize duels. El Corvio's right to the duel will be acknowledged as lawful. Well, um, Bran Branta has a healthy respect for Court of Honor and uh, its decisions. But what I don't like about this case is that Remy Elverman basically allowed himself to be bullied into sanctioning this duel. He did not sanction it because it was an honorable thing to do, but because Alan El Corvio used his political influence to bully uh, the local court of honor into sanctioning uh, this duel. Not good. Moreover, I am deeply disturbed by El Verman's uh, opinion that uh, El Estes uh, should not uh, uh, have justice. They, they do not deserve justice because they are not strong or influential enough. So, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something daring and stupid. Elverman thinks I am beneath him thumb. It's time to prove him wrong. I'm gonna go off a script here a little bit, because uh, the script doesn't represent what Bran wants to say. I shake my head dispassionately. It pains me... To see, Sir Magistrate, that you care so little about your fellow nobles of a sort. Here before lies, before us, sorry, before us, lies a splendid young man, the heir to noble family. And you dismiss his death because his family is not as strong as they used to be? Well, what an insolence! Are we nobles of Magra? Uh, are we to allow some capital upstarts uh, to bully us? To bully our noble court of honor into sanctioning uh, their duels uh, whenever they please? I say no. We do not have the right to dismiss our fellow nobles uh, so easily and so carelessly. The magistrate's face falls in surprise. And Brante, you don't seem to realize how the world works. I just told you, El Corvo plays an important role in the Emperor's court. Are you really so eager to make enemies? Well, you're about to. No connections will protect you if you're so intent upon trampling ancient noble traditions. 
I'm afraid, Sir Lerman, it is you who are trampling upon our noble traditions. You uh, are trampling upon our noble dynasties and deny them justice. How disgraceful is that? I see you do you care not about noble estate as much as you claim to. And I'm afraid it is you who are mistaken. It is you who are not aware that I have friends in very high places. You are not my only resource, you are not my only backup, Sir Verman. Do not delusion yourself. The Archduke's family will readily side with me. My magistrate dashes to El Corvo, fuming with rage at my words. Uh, Sir El Corvo, this is a, a, a terrible misunderstanding. I'll do everything I can to right the wrong, but uh, uh, these good sirs mean to uh, have you arrested. Gendarmes. Seize his sword, shackle him, and take him to the prefecture. I will deal with him immediately. You dare call me a murderer? Hasn't anyone in your filthy, decrepit province know the meaning of a duel? Oh, we know the meaning of a duel perfectly well, Sir El Calvio. And you are gonna face punishment for bullying our court of honor into sanctioning your duel. He draws his sword and assumes a defensive stance. But I start giving commands to the gendarmes, and following my orders, they manage to surround and disarm El Corvo. <laughs> okay, um... I'm gonna take care of the paperwork and, more importantly, send a message to Octavia. My dear lady, I write, uh, I humbly ask you to convince the aristocracy to side with me in ordering the death penalty for El Corvea. He is a complete outsider in Magra, who happened to murder the heir to the ancient bloodline of El Este. This is a disgrace, this is an insult to our nobility, so surely you can aid... Uh, your little pumpkin pie in such a trifling matter. You will help your pumpkin pumpkin pie, yeah? Her reply takes almost no time to arrive. El Corvo is a staunch follower of a Tempest and the new overseer. Me too, but that does not excuse him. This puts him at great odds with my father. Removing him will be easy, especially if you have a proper case against him. Oh, I do, I do. Rest assured, Bran, the Milandes dynasty will side with you in this trial. As for other nobles, have no fear. I will let no harm come to you, my dearest human. Oh, you, my blueberry cake. El Corvo's trial comes and goes incredibly quickly. The seats in the courtroom are absolutely empty, no noble risks appearing in defense of the visitor from Eterna and attracting the displeasure of Archduke Milanidas. Okay, I present evidence of El Corvo's guilt. It's fairly easy to do because uh, duels are banned in the Empire. The Court of Honor exists in a murky area uh, between legal and illegal. So, the ill fated noble visitor coldly spits out threats in return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Board of Justice makes its final judgment. Oh, Elborn presides. Nice. Sending a noble to the hereafter is never easy. But there are times when the court has no other way to instill respect for imperial law and the goals of the noble estate. Sir El Corvo, we hereby sentence you to true death by decapitation. The sentence will be carried out in Majesty Square tomorrow. Oh, decapitation! I love decapitations! <laughs> El Corvo is silent, unwilling to believe in what has just happened. But the verdict has been made. El Corvo is taken to the dungeon. Tomorrow, the city of Anizot will, for the first time, witness a noble being executed for a duel, because there is no higher power than imperial power. I am the law here. I have the power here. Yes. Oh, shit. That was an unpleasant sound to hear. Okay, the aristocracy of Anizot is indignant over my decision, and yet El Corvo's shameful end of a, and the executioner's block goes seemingly unnoticed in the capital. Soon rumors begin to spread, some say the beheaded nobleman was indeed a traitor to the crown. Interesting. Maybe Sir El maybe late Sir El Este uh, was right about something, maybe he uh, accused El Corvo justly and paid with his life for his words. Nonetheless, he was avenged, as he should be. He is a noble of a sort, his life should be avenged. Soon after the execution, something arrives on my doorstep. A small yet hefty chest with a note attached. Hmm, interesting. Sir Brante, we realize how difficult it must have been for you to deliver this strict yet righteous verdict. 
We mourn the loss of our son, who transgressed against the law forbidding all duels. I, uh, I think he just was a brave young man, that's all. Yet justice has found his murderer thanks to you. Please accept this humble gift as a token of our gratitude. Sir Constance L. Este and Lady Margaret L. Este. Oh, his parents sent me a, a box with jewels as a sign of gratitude. Oh, that's very nice. Actually, uh, we escaped the tyranny of the nobles and uh, dropped our career a little bit. Our justice is one step away from uh, getting at the point where commoners are protected by the law, which is nice. And our wealth grows by the minute. Nice. We have many uh, boxes with such treasures inside. Okay, what? The hunt for Thomas? Oh. Oh shit. Oh shit. Thomas is not rescued, so... Uh-oh. Okay, I'm shaving before going to work. Uh, I scoop some warm water from the wash basin. Uh, a servant rushes in with an urgent letter or rather a crumbled note. Uh, I flinch involuntarily, involuntarily, a nasty cut appears on my cheek. The letter is from a childhood friend of mine, uh oh. Bran, I am in trouble. Otto knows that I helped you, now he's finally... Uh, helped? Ah, uh, well, he, uh, he did inform me of Otto's transgressions, I understand. Now he's finally decided to get rid of me. His henchmen are on my trail already, well, we'll find me no matter how well I hide. I am out of time, Brante. If you can, for the sake of our old friendship, help me out of this mess, somehow. If Otten finds me, I'll be off to the Shining Pillar. I'm all out of lives. Your friend, Thomas. Oh god. My old friend is in danger because he helped me with a case against Otten. If I don't interfere, he is doomed. What can't we do? We can't eliminate Otten's henchmen because uh, Thomas must be in hiding. And uh, we, we could have bribed prefecture gendarmes to capture and kill the enemies threatening Thomas, but it would have damaged our career, blah blah. Okay, if we don't get involved, Thomas Guerra is a dead man. But we will replenish our willpower. And if we protect him, reputation goes down. One lesser death, and we spend willpower. Uh, the good thing is that we increase our valor, and obviously Thomas will be rescued. Hell, I must say this game is brilliantly brutal. This is a great uh, what you are in the dark moment, in my opinion. Because, as you can see, not getting involved does not cost us anything. Like, even our off of friendship uh, with Thomas... Uh, means nothing by this point. Because uh, if Thomas uh, is killed, nobody will ever know that I betrayed him. Nobody will ever know that we were friends, that I made such an oath at Vayet, uh, and that I betrayed his promise. And protecting him costs us a lot, to say the least. We actually gonna uh, drop our reputation down to 6, to modest position. We will end up in a very precarious situation, uh, further away from nobility of the sort. And the willpower will be spent on all this uh, other stuff. A great what you are in the dark moment. Doing a right thing uh, costs us very much. Doing uh, nothing, being selfish, costs us nothing. And truth be told, at this point we are not even that close with Thomas. Like, he's indifferent to us, uh, he thinks he can't trust us, and all that stuff. Like, he... F I guess he's indifferent because he thinks uh, nobody can help him now, and uh, we can't help him now. After all, we uh, ourselves told him that Thomas, I'm in no position to help you right now, so he is desperate and uh, he uh, is sure that uh, we are gonna leave him to die. Great moment, great, great choice, very difficult. Made all the more difficult because this option is close to us. You know what? Bran Brante might have been a shitty friend. To Thomas several times actually but I'm here when it matters 
Hold on, Thomas. I'm coming. I'm coming, Thomas. Hold on. I'm your brave knight in, in shining armor. I will not fail you, my friend. I crumple up the note, pick up my sword, and rush to help him. I know where he has been trying to hide recently, the ruined palace of Charmilan, it is where I use where we used to play as children. Uh, it all comes together. I get there just in time. I hear a familiar voice coming from the ruins of an ancient bathhouse. Quit hiding, you bastards! You won't take me without spilling some blood of your own! I follow the cry. In the middle of the old bathhouse, I see Thomas, dirty, his hair overgrown, a sword clutch in his hand. Five men, inconspicuously dressed in coarse clothing and wielding various weapons, are slowly closing in on him. You bastards, you outnumber him, you fuckers! We all freeze, stunned by my unexpected appearance. <laughs> what took you so long, Brante? Oh, fear not, my fair damsel, I'm here to rescue you! <laughs> I hear intense joy in his voice. I rush to Thomas' side. Back to back, we start to fight. Uh, we are more skilled than Otton's henchmen, but they outnumber us. Shitheads. Uh, I do not let them surround us, but the fight is still a tough one. We succeed in wounding one of the enemies in the leg and force him to drop out of the battle. But another huge bruiser is swinging a club wildly, and all I can do is dodge. We are quickly becoming exhausted. Thomas keeps pace with me. He performs a masterful counterattack against one of the enemies and skewers him with his sword. Unfortunately, his weapon becomes stuck in the enemy's body. With a swift turn, I put myself in the line of fire and catch the blade of the other assailant with my glove. I steer the tip away from Thomas and run my sword through the fuck's stomach. Yeah! But my triumph is short lived. I momentarily lose track of a big fellow and he lands a heavy blow on my back. My ribs crack. I am thrown several feet away. The fox swings the bloodied club again. Thomas hurries to help me. Die, you bastard! Everything turns red. I lie motionless and listen as the fight continues. Ooh. Until several shrieks of agony announce that it is over. Thomas leans over me. <laughs> hey, 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 Brandt. I just ask you to help, not, not to die in my place. My old friend's stupid joke is the last thing I hear. Yeah, one thing I always dreamt to hear before my second death. Stupid jokes of Thomas. The rest of the world dissolves in a white light. Second death. Oh oh. Impenetrable darkness surrounds me. I stand alone, bare to my very essence. It paralyzes me. I have an urge to cover myself, to hide. But I cannot conceal the truth in this place. I am bathed in an unbearably bright light. It has no hint of warmth in it. It is blinding. It leaves no shadows. It is the light of the shining pillar itself. In this radiance I can clearly see all my thoughts and doubts, my errors and transgressions, my many transgressions, the contradictions that have permitted me since birth. They cover me from head to toe. I am naked. I feel liberated and whole. It is as though the scales have fallen from my eyes. I see the true shapes of things now. There are the laws by which the world abides, the grand design that moves life itself. I tread a path that is barely visible in the blinding light, giving shape to everything. In this light I see the infinite complexity of the world, from the tiniest leaf to the enormity of the empire. And this world maintains its balance by virtue of the law that was embedded in it during the act of creation. Ahead of you two figures are waiting on the path. They are gigantic, many times taller than a man. The younger twin gazes at me sternly, coldly. I kneel obediently before him and lower my head. A god raises his sword above me. This is divine retribu retribution. There is no law without it, nor can there be. Every action has consequences. This is what shapes the world making its very existence possible. In this moment, beneath the gaze of a merciless god, I comprehend the law that binds the entire world together. Which manifestation of the law in will... In, uh, which manifestation of the law will I live by? Empire. The great and incredible sophisticated mode of existence for all people. Cause. 
My life's work shapes the world, and thus I influence the great law itself. My destiny is my own manifestation of the divine law, my lot. I am an embodiment of the law. I have been made in accordance with the divine design. It is the law that has been with, you, with me since the day I was born. Family. My family is a model of the world, a tiny universe, and it belongs to me just as I belong in it, or against the law. I defy the design of the gods and the law that binds it together. Interesting. Very interesting. What does Brent Brenta believe in? What is the law that binds the universe together? What is the law that brings all the creation in one comprehensible structure? I think I understand the twins' design better. They gave every human two things. The breath of life and the will to struggle. And with it, the humans and Archneans gain a very special gift. Our life's work shapes the world. And each of us, no matter how low-born or high-born, each of us influences the great law itself. This is the truth. This is how the world turns around, by our actions and choices. This is my answer, younger twin. The blade slashes. The younger sword slashes through the air above my head. I do not yet deserve my final punishment. The law demands that I continue my life. The younger extends his gigantic hand and shows me the way. I must proceed. The path leads me to the top of the crown of a silver tree, spread wide in the white gleam. The branches are closed now, it is time to descend. I am drawn downward into darkness, but the purity and clarity of spirit are still with you. The twins give us nothing but we will to struggle, but with it we might be able to change the very design of the twins. I understand now. And now I have to open my eyes. Above me is the dark ceiling of the crypt. <clears throat> I am reborn. I awaken in the crypt. No one is there to meet me. It is quite possible that no one knows about my death. The battle in the abandoned palace of Charmilanidas is the talk of the city for several days. My name somehow goes up. Commander Otten does not openly accuse me, if he did he would have to explain what his men were doing there, but his schemes make it much more difficult for my brother Stefan to have a Branta family ennobled by a sword. Oh, you are a good enemy, Doris Otten, you are a worthy opponent. Your schemes and plots impede me and my family greatly, but we will see who will emerge victorious in the end. Thomas fled right after the fight. It takes quite some time for me to get any news from him. Bran, as soon as we thought of those facts, I decided to go into hiding somewhere far away from Andesot. Without his spies, Otten seems to have lost my trail, and it's all thanks to you. I am in your eternal debt, Brand. I hope you take down that bastard and put an end to his crimes once and for all. We'll meet again. Your friend, Thomas. We improve our relations with Thomas back to positive and uh, we rescued our friend. No matter how many times we might have been a shitty friend to him, at the end we were with him. We were with him when it mattered. Nice. What is not nice is that our reputation goes down. Thanks to Otten. Shithead. Okay, I think this scene will be our last for today. Elfero's List I spent day after day hard at work, toiling over Orton's case, but something far more urgent demands the prefecture's attention today. The city is in chaos, there was an explosion in the square in front of the city hall. Huh? Oh, oh. Someone threw a bomb at Magistrate Remy Elverman's carriage. The assassination attempt failed because the Magistrate was not inside the carriage, uh, but his servants and driver did not fare so well. Oh, the last straw. 
throwing bombs and killing people like that. Uh, even here in my office I can still smell the as acrid smoke from the blast. I don't support this thing. I don't support terrorism and violence. Uh, commoners should obtain their rights peacefully through legitimate power structures. Okay, the gendarmes reacted quickly. Five suspects, craftsmen and factory workers were brought to the prefecture before sunset. They are accused of joining the last straw, a secret society of insurgents seeking to overthrow imperial rule. This society is on its way to becoming the talk of the city. Rumor has it, the leader is an enigmatic woman by the name of Sophia. Yeah, of course. The five suspects deny their involvement, but a number of eyewitnesses saw them walking towards the square, and some of them still have traces of gunpowder on their fingers. Judge Carl for Graben has taken the case. <sighs> the trial will be mercilessly swift, of course. The five are to be hanged tomorrow morning. Okay. As the sun begins to set, a stranger enters my office. Pale, with chiseled features, a furrowed brow, a thick black mustache, and dark eyes watching me intently. He presents me with a gilded pendant in the shape of a wheel. Baron Philippe L. Ferrer, Secret Chancellor Advisor. I imagine you are well aware that we deal with plot schemes and revolts against the Empire. I have a matter of great importance to the Empire to discuss with you, Sir Brante. I am aware that the case of the explosion in the square was not assigned to you, but for our purposes this is actually for the best. The Secret Chancellor has been following this so-called Last Straw group for a long time now. They are the greatest threat to peace in Anizot. But you can help us rid the city of this menace. He produces a neatly folded sheet of paper. This is a list of known insurgents connected to the Last Straw. We haven't blown anyone up just yet, but surely you realize that it would be most imprudent to wait for them to commit their next crime. The time to act is now. I scan the list quickly, some of the names on it seem somewhat familiar, perhaps from my youth. Find a way, any way, to implicate them in today's assassination attempt, and you will prevent more explosions in the future. The Empire will rest easy if we can rid ourselves of this scum as quickly as possible. If you render this service to the Secret Chancellery, you may rely on my assistance in the future. As you may suspect, I have more than my fair share of powerful connections. The Secret Chancellor Advisor pierces me with his heavy gaze. Okay, uh, we have uh, an unlocked option, Obey the Secret Chancellor. Uh, it will tremendously worsen justice in our province and uh, worsen our unity and worsen our relations with our father. So basically, this is the option to sentence these people to death on false charges. Mm, a rotten deal. We can protect the people on the list, refuse advisor Elfera and protect the people from the Secret Chancellery. They are innocent until proven guilty. It will worsen our career, improve our justice, worsen our reputation further, but improve our unity. Mm, not that good. I can't allow myself to worsen our reputation any further. I'm already in a precarious position. Conduct an investigation. Before doing anything to the people on the list, I must find proof of their guilt. So, it will improve both our career and justice, uh, and we're gonna spend a point of wealth, uh, I guess, to pay for this investigation. Yeah. What is Shelter of Suspects? Oh, oh, to unlock it, we must know Gloria's secret uh, about uh, her uh, secret society of poets, of commoner poets, back from our adolescence. So I guess some of the people from this list uh, are these uh, young commoners who used to write poetry with Gloria. And we can refuse to accept the case and warn the people of the danger looming over them. It will worsen our justice because we uh, will still break the law, we will still shelter potential mutinies and uh, criminals. But it will improve our unity, our wealth, and improve our relations with Gloria. I am choosing between conducting an investigation and sheltering the suspects. It's a tough choice to make. 
but I think we have established uh, f uh, quite firmly that uh, Bran Brand prizes uh, honor and kindness more than he does the law. And also he is a little bit sentimental. So... I look through the list. Ten unfamiliar names. Uh, or are they? I seem to remember some of them. They are friends of my sister. She used to go to the old castle ruins with them to read poetry so long ago. I am not gonna send her old friends to the gallows on trumped up charges. No matter how much it violates the imperial law. Elborn prizes the law so much, but what good is the law if good people are about to suffer from it? Baron Lferra. Regretfully, I can't be of service. This is a very significant case, and I fear I don't have what it takes. I am... Uh, I am too much of a pussy, Baron, sorry. Sorry. Too much of a pussy, good sir. It would be prudent of me to recommend one of my colleagues in my steed. Uh, Karlo for Graben is far more experienced in such matters. The Secret Chancellor Advisor needs his brow. I expected your loyalty to be stronger, Brante. Very well. I hope the other judges will be far more decisive and far less reluctant to get their hands dirty in order to save the Empire. Good day. Okay, I go to Gloria's room as soon as I return home. Sis, we are in trouble. Uh, the Secret Chancellor is looking for your old friends from the Poetry Society. Uh, look, uh, I guess you might have lost touch with them, but perhaps you could... The Secret Chancellor? I need to warn them. We don't meet very often these days, but we have mutual friends. There's still time. Then run like hell, sis. Run like hell. Gloria rushes outside. She returns only at nightfall, carrying a hefty purse full of coins. Well, I was just in time. They've left Anizot until things settled down. We would have been caught by now if not for you. I know you didn't do it for money, but uh, this is from my friends. A token of uh, gratitude to our family. <laughs> we have accumulated so much tokens of gratitude. <laughs> like the wine from uh, Father Mark, the um, box from Octavia, the box from El Este, and now this. <laughs> we are basically swimming in tokens of gratitude. <laughs> Were these people involved in the crimes committed by Velastro? No one will even ever know now. Neither you, nor Gloria, nor the Secret Chancellor. I don't care. I I assume these guys were just uh, rebellious poets, nothing more. If I was wrong, well, I was wrong. I still regret nothing because I saved the lives of people I know to be good. I regret nothing. Yes, they have managed to escape persecution. The morning after, the prefecture is buzzing like a kicked hornet's nest. Judge Fograben took up the case eagerly, but now I watch indifferently as he sweats and fidgets, casting glances at the door and waiting for advisor Elferrer to arrive. He sent gendarmes for the suspect last night, but they came back empty-handed. What's the matter, Carla? Things not looking so good anymore? I avoid the head of a secret chancellor for now. I can only hope I will never cross paths again. Oh, we improve our relations with Gloria. She is sympathetic to us once more. Now she knows I am not this snobbish uh, kind of noble. I am I am relatable guy. I am all out for the little guy. I like to help little guys. Yeah, we drop justice. La la la. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, wait a second. I didn't notice. Actually, this decision allowed us to improve our wealth, to raise our wealth up to 10. Uh, what does it mean? I'm sorry, I said it would be the last scene, but I need to know what happens next. A family of means. Okay. Over the past few years, our family has grown wealthy beyond imagination. Whatever money we had, we took good care of and made more, all thanks to my uncanny aptitude for profit. Huh. Guys, we have maximized our wealth. We are rich. We are a rich family. We are a prosperous house. <laughs> the word hardship is long forgotten at home. Whatever luxury we crave, we can afford it. 
The entire city knows that the Branta family is an affluent one. It is late in the evening on a sultry summer day. The sun has set, and father slowly measures the porch with his steps, sliding from one corner to the other. My son, look how we've prospered. If you ask me, we Brantas have grown too used to our humble way of life. We don't have to be thrifty anymore. Let's invest our wealth in the family, we won't run out of money anytime soon. Great idea, father. You've done so much to ensure our prosperity, son. It is only fair for you to decide what we should invest our fortune. Where we should invest our fortune. A, a funny thing is that most of this wealth is really uh, uh, various signs and tokens of gratitude. <laughs> most of this wealth is not like some uh, invest, uh, investments or, or land estates, uh, but simply uh, like presents, gifts. <laughs> funny. Okay. I'm sorry I uh, speak so clumsily, I'm just uh, overjoyed uh, about this turn of events. Okay, I cast a glance over the family estate. How will I spend our wealth? Okay, we can invest in the house. It will increase our unity. We can host a gala uh, to show the nobles of the city how the Brantas have flourished. It will increase our reputation. Hmm. Or we will expand the library and uh, improve all our stats, all our skills. Well, I say uh, that we are a hospitable family, we like to throw parties, I like parties very much, I like balls and galas and uh, receptions and such, and besides we badly need reputation, so... I think, father, that it is time the noble families of Anizot learned the extent of the Brantas' prosperity. Let us host a grand party for the entire city. We have the money to afford a luxurious gala that will satisfy even the most demanding, most demanding tastes. A gala of our own? Excellent idea, my son. Money comes and goes, but the memory of a great gala will endure. My thoughts exactly. So I begin the preparations. Money and effort are no object. We are dirty rich. Soon the most esteemed nobles of Anizot receive the invitations. Marvels of calligraphy on delicate perfumed paper. Mmm. Our family estate is too small and humble to provide for every guest, so we rent a country manor from an old noble dynasty and hire an army of servants to whip it into shape, prepare the feast and serve the guests. Hoo -hoo. The gala is immaculate, splendid, perfect. With a smile I watch the city's nobles dazzled and awed by our work. All this majesty afforded by a humble family of a mantle. I kind of feel guilty that uh, we mm, do all of this while uh, there is misery and devastation in Magra, but uh, uh, there isn't much to be done uh, about it, like uh, I can't resolve it all on my own, so I do what I can. And uh, it is not a crime to spend a pleasant evening with noble guests, I guess. The night ends with my pride and joy, a marvelous, colorful fireworks display. It illuminates the skies before Anizot like a miracle, like, literally decadent nobles feasting and enjoying life while commoners <laughs> uh, struggle and suffer. But I hope we will improve this, this situation in the province soon. I hope so. Favor was right. This gala will not soon be forgotten by the city of Anizot. Our wealth uh, drops down to simple affluence we uh, spend. Our, uh, a portion of our wealth to host this gala, and our reputation goes up to seven. We are once again renowned among nobles. Haha! <laughs> Eat shit, Otan. Your schemes and plots will not stop me from having a good time and improving my family station. My willpower is good. Oh, a special event. A family of means. The Branta family becomes known throughout the city for its wealth. We are rich even among nobles. Nice. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Another one? Okay. Okay, uh, this is a great point to end this episode. Guys, join us next time as we continue the story of the Branta family and Bran Branta in particular. Until next time, take care. See you later.